Something happened for me in India. On one occasion being in a car at 120 miles an hour on a one lane road in the middle of nowhere. And as I looked at this oncoming truck heading towards our tiny car, I'll never forget the moment when I realized we were going to hit each other. I realized I was going to die. And it was like a complete acceptance of my death. And I flashed all the memories of my life, regrets I had had, things I had not said, things I had not communicated, things I wish I had done more of. Facing my death and making peace with my death has made me more and more fearless. I mean, there's a few variables that I can control, but most of life is out of my control. My father would often ask me this question as a kid, did you bring yourself to this planet? Why so much fear about what's going to happen in the future? Why so much fear about your life? That force, that intelligence of life that brought you here, surely it knows how to fulfill your destiny. It knows how to fulfill your life, so trust it. The world is coming together. Technology is bringing the world together. Social media is bringing the world together that I think we must be in gratitude and use all, the, all these means, but not forget to connect to who we are inside. Age 14, something really profound happened for me in my life. I remember being in church service. My father decides to announce to the congregation that uh, my son is uh, going to be taking over the ministry. That's not a small thing, considering like in Africa, there's like about 300 churches, hundreds of thousands of followers. On one level, I love my father. On one level, I wanted to make a difference. On one level, all these people were counting on me, but my heart was calling me in a whole different direction. It took a, a lot of courage for me to develop the strength to go up to him and let him know that I was not going to be taking over his churches. For me, I'd say that day I had that conversation with my father was the day I became a man. I started to develop an obsession with trying to understand life and from the age I uh, started reading books, everyone from people like Shakti Gawain to Charles Fillmore of Unity to Ernest Holmes and the Science of Mind teaching to Joseph, the mystics, Joseph Murphy to Theosophy to Krishnamurti to people like Deepak Chopra and some of the Western, you know, pop psychology, Wayne Dyer, Nathaniel Brandon, Dan Millman, Louise Hay, you know, for me, Tony Robbins, these were at that stage, they were my icons, they were my heroes. I had a vision and a dream to come to America. As I said, all of the authors and teachers I'd read about, heard about, they all lived here. So we live in a world where we can send people to the moon. We live in a world where we have iPhones and iPods and computers and internet. And we live in such an amazing world and we can't even feed people. We can't even take care of, of our fellow brothers and sisters. Part of my mission is to inspire an awakening of consciousness. Part of my mission on this planet is to spread love. I don't really coach people, I uncoach, I unteach, I untrain. I believe that who we are at the core is already whole and complete. So I create processes and experiences that really assist people in transforming, that really assist people in peeling those layers away so that you can ultimately get back in touch with the essence of who you've always been all along. So I just want to say thank you for being who you are. Are you loving fully? or are you not? To me, the new paradigm is really getting in touch with your gifts and giving what you are. And you can give it right now. We're not just here to hang out. We have gathered with an intent on loving. I was born in Ghana, West Africa. My father's from Ghana, my mother's Japanese. And they couldn't communicate on a verbal level, but I think at the, on the level of the heart, they were completely in sync and connected. And I believe that love knows no boundaries, love knows no color. On my journeys to India, I went and spent some time with a dear friend of mine. This man at the time was an 82-year-old former disciple of Gandhi, serving the underprivileged in India and the poorest state for about 50 years. His name was Dwarkaji. I remember going to his orphanage, spending about two weeks with these kids. And what's interesting is they don't have too many social skills and they don't really respond. So I was loving them. I didn't feel like I was getting anything back. So I got a little frustrated and I got a little tired. 
I told him this, I said I was going to take a few weeks off and he says, you know, it's fine to go meditate. Just make sure that while you are meditating, you do not allow your heart to turn to stone. Because right in front of you, in this ashram, are living Buddhists, waiting to be worshipped, waiting to be served. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Love isn't just saving all the whales in the ocean or all the children in India or giving water to everyone in Africa. Every single day of our lives, we have an opportunity to love. And we don't have to go far and wide to love that every single moment of our lives is really that invitation to love, that invitation to give, the invitation to serve right now. And to me, every second of being alive itself is miraculous. My father has about 300 churches in West Africa, hundreds of thousands of followers. I grew up seeing my father perform miracles, the blind seeing, the deaf hearing, cancer being cured. I grew up with a sense that there were no real limitations. In media and different sources want us to believe that we're limited, then we can be controlled. But we are not as limited as we've been led to believe. The evolutionary process that we've reached right now is, I believe, not the end of our capacity, but actually the beginning of our capacity. A free mind is not a Buddhist mind, a Jewish mind, a Islamic mind. A free mind is free. You know, as I journeyed on, I continued my ministry. I continued in my father's church, age 14, age 15. And I felt that life had more to teach me than an institution, than books, than theory. I wanted to dive into life. I wanted to learn from life. What would happen if we were as committed to loving as we were to making money, if we were as committed to loving as we were to looking good, if we were as committed to loving as we were to our addictions? How would that impact life? How would that impact our focus? The last 14 years I've had the privilege of working with some of the most amazing individuals from all walks of life. I have clients in about 20 countries. I mean, literally everyone ranging from billionaires, celebrities, pop stars, athletes, salespeople, insurance agents, circus performers, children, mothers, you name it. To me, transformation is not a business. It's never really been a business. I've felt a calling in my veins, in my blood. This is why I'm here, is to inspire, is to empower, is to give hope and to remind each person on this planet of who they truly are. We all want the same thing, that is to love and to be loved and to express love. And I think love is the force that connects us all together. All the great teachers of past, the great saints, the great gurus, the great mystics, the enlightened beings, the consciousness that they have held just stating, we're all being invited now to raise our consciousness to that level, to that frequency, to that vibration. To me, this is why we are born, this is why we are alive, that we all have that capacity to realize who we are. My question to you, my friend, is are you loving radically?